Uh, Ching Yicheng, is there a role for China in a conflict of this type that we are seeing in Yemen right now? I mean, China is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Can it bring pressure on the sides to reach some kind of agreement, some kind of settlement? Uh, for that part, I'm not quite sure. But for China, it always uh, believes in the value of peace and also uh, multilateralism. They always believe uh, that all nations should work together instead of just like unilaterally uh, uh, impose their value or their idea on certain plane and and even uh, you know bring up a, a war against a country okay let's move on to the very tragic mosque shooting in Canada mm -hmm. Haroon a French Canadian university student was charged with the murder of six people uh, who were shot during prayers at a mosque in Quebec last Sunday. Now, Quebec has one of the highest rates of Muslim immigration in Canada. And, you know, here is something that we never expect to hear out of Canada, these kind of attacks with people being murdered in this way. What else do you know about these murders? You see, we normally associate these uh, mosque killings and so on with the United States, not, in, not Canada. But at the same mm. time, Canada has not been immune from Islamophobia. We have had Trumpism long before Donald Trump came to the United States. Um, it's obviously a, uh, a tremendously uh, tragic uh, occasion. But the good that has come out of it is that many, many Canadians, including those Quebecers who have uh, made Islamophobic statements in the past, are doing a mea culpa and saying, we need to stop and rethink this. So you know, I mean, the argument becomes, this guy, uh, the alleged killer, um, is a great fan of uh, Mr. Trump. He's a great fan of Maurice Le Pen in France. So did that cause him to go and do it? Obviously not. But at the same time, you cannot rule out the possibility that fanning prejudice, fanning bigotry, fanning hatred leads to tragedies. I mean, this is one of those occasions that we need to take stock. And Canadians are taking stock at this point. Nathan, there are reports that the alleged shooter is a white nationalist who apparently uh, supports Donald Trump. Uh, we heard from the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. We had a very adult response from him, something very mature. And he said, look, we will take in those refugees who've been banned by the United States. Mm. Uh, although his predecessor, Stephen Harper, wouldn't have done that. Right. So it depends, uh, it depends on, on the government. But you're yes. absolutely right. There has been a feeling here where certain countries like Canada can actually capitalise on, on what's happened uh, in terms of the uh, travel ban or... or um, delay or whatever you want to call it. Um, and Canada has uh, had very good PR in terms of uh, reaching out to refugees. They're, they're like Germany has been uh, as well. And the interesting thing about this attack is the immediate US media reaction, especially on the right, was, oh, it's got to be someone from the Maghreb, the Middle East, or something like that. And it turns out not to be. And the big question is, do you label attacks like this terrorism? Right. Or do, and do you lump in uh, uh, obviously white nationalists with potential uh, radical Islamists as well? The answer is yes, because they're all crimes. But when you get to sort of slicing and dicing no, no, one, and one man's terrorist and other person's resistor, you are on very difficult ground. Right, and actually, if we look at the rhetoric, if we listen to what's being said, it seems logic's been thrown out the window here because the White House cited this mosque attack as a justification for its travel exactly. ban. I mean, that's despite the fact that <laughs> the victims were actually Muslims in this case. Um, and that led the former Canadian Governor General... We live in an Orwellian world here. You know? Right. <laughs> Adrienne Clarkson, she said that the attack shows how Canada could be drawn into what she called the ugliness south of the border. Mm -hmm. Right. It's very interesting. You know, uh, several of us have talked about how words have consequences. Mm. I guess in this environment, tweets have consequences right. as well. But, but, I mean, they really do in, the, in, the sense, in, in this sense. I mean, Donald Trump based his campaign on this idea of making America great again. Now, as an American, I, I, I thought America was great. Uh, and, and America was great and still is great because of so many things. It's the best research universities in the world, a welcoming environment for immigrants, uh, you know, it, the best capital markets in the world, an entrepreneurial spirit. And all of those things still exist and will exist, no matter who's the president of the United States. But when the president of the United States does create an environment um, in which immigrants are fearful, in which your people that are being labeled and fearful, then, then he's, what he's doing is he's making America less great, you know, because there's this great adage that <clears throat> you can't be great unless you're good, yeah. right? Um, and, and a good country can be great. And I think Canada is showing a great deal of goodness uh, here. Uh, and maybe they're on the way to greatness as well. Right, let's move on to our final topic. And that is China's global view. Ching Chang, the Chinese president, Xi, uh, Xi Jinping, 
uh, was in Switzerland just two weeks ago. He made two very important speeches, one to the World Economic Forum in Davos and the other to the United Nations um, in Geneva. Let's take a listen to part of what he had to say. The essence of sovereign equality is that the sovereignty and the dignity of all countries, whether big or small, strong or weak, rich or poor, must be respected. Their internal affairs cannot be subject to interference, and they have the right to independently choose their social systems and development paths. I should say that shortly after President Xi made that speech, Donald Trump made his inauguration speech here in Washington. They couldn't be two more different speeches. Here we had the Chinese leader outward looking, talking about a global vision, and we had Donald Trump talking about America first. Uh, in a sense, is China stepping into a vacuum here, taking the leadership role that appears to be absent under Donald Trump? Uh, yes or no. But basically what uh, President Xi Jinping uh, is saying is that China will uphold the current value, as, which is multilateralism, the free trade uh, in the world. And also uh, we, we should, as uh, humankind, we should tackle the, the issue of climate change and, and banning the nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, all those actually help the world uh, uh, stable and prosperous for the past 60 years. So those are good things that we should keep doing. So for China, we just want to really uphold those uh, values. And also, we also, we also from uh, President Xi Jinping's words, we also heard he uh, mentioned about the uh, Chinese tradition value, which is have a good will to your yeah. neighbors. And also, maybe there is a difference between you and your neighbor. You can live harmoniously. And one more thing important value that he said is that uh, for Chinese people, we don't do things to others that we, won't, we want those things to do to, to ourselves. Right. So that's our important value. So uh, for, your, uh, for your question, I would mm -hmm. say China just really uh, treasure uh, and, 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 and cherish uh, the, the current situation, the stability and the prosperity in the world. Nathan, if we look at that speech that President Xi mm. made at the World Economic Forum, it was a vigorous defense of globalization. He talked about interconnected growth. Then afterwards, he made that speech at the United Nations in which he talked about a world without nuclear weapons. Again, on that particular issue, that's an issue that's of concern to every single person on the planet. China's taking the lead again. Uh, well, it's interesting you talk about uh, nuclear weapons because remember there was that nuclear security summit uh, here in the, right. in, the, in the last year of the Obama administration. And that was one area where the Obama administration and um, uh, President Xi Jinping thought they could really make some progress in terms of uh, keeping materials safe across borders, um, monitoring stockpiles, but also moving to a trust building in terms of proliferation. Remember, they just worked out the Iran deal together. So this, this, this makes sense. Now... Uh, if you look at Beijing and Washington, will there be the trust to de-escalate in terms of nuclear posturing? Uh, you know, we've heard already from uh, Donald Trump loose talk about nukes uh, on the campaign trail. Um, there is a possibility that there may be some reductions with Moscow, but that was iced in the last days of the Obama administration. So there is a vacuum here. And remember, regionally, this is very, very important because it's actually a signal from Beijing saying, Engage on this. DPRK is rapidly modernizing its nuclear arsenal. We need to negotiate these things away. Arun, let's look at uh, the uh, China-Canada relationship. You know, Canada has a special place in China because it was your current prime minister, Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau, who recognized the People's Republic way back in uh, 1970, nine years before the United States did so. How would you characterize the relationship right now? Now, the relationship is uh, smooth, uh, it's professional. Um, we are, uh, of course, trying to increase our trade with China. Um, in fact, Mr. Trudeau, the current prime minister, is walking a tightrope between two poles here. Um, he is being urged to criticize Mr. Trump, for example, on some of his uh, measures vis-a-vis -vis immigration and refugees and so on. But at the same time, the uh, United States is Canada's large, by far the biggest trader and so on. So Justin Trudeau is walking a fine line there, while at the same time trying to open the door as much as possible to China to increase our trade. And the last immigration minister, the man who brought in 35,000 Syrian refugees successfully to Canada, 
uh, has just been named ambassador to Beijing, it shows the importance that mm. this government rightly places on our relationship with China. Afshin, uh, President Xi, as I pointed out, uh, defended globalization during that speech at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Let's take a listen to what he had to say there, part of what he had to say. It's true that economic globalization has created new problems, but this is not justification to write off economic globalization altogether. Pursuing protectionism is like locking oneself in a dark room. Wind and rain may be kept outside, but so is light and air. No one will emerge as a winner in a trade war. Was that a message to Donald Trump then? I think it was. I think it was. And I also think it was good. You know, I've been waiting for someone to make a robust defense of globalization, you know, particularly at a head of state level. It turns out that it's President Xi Jinping who does it. Uh, and, you know, and I think it's important to make that defense of globalization because for all of its flaws, I mean, we, ha we cannot forget that since the early 1990s, about a billion people have been lifted from poverty. You know, girls have more access to education than they have ever had, you know, in history, for example, as just one example. And you can go through the data points uh, and, and every, you know, data point you look at are moving as the, the, the saying goes, up and to the right. Now, certainly there's going to be losers. We need to do more, uh, particularly here in the United States with the deindustrialized Midwest. But those jobs were lost because of robots, not because of chi trade Absolutely. with China. And they're being lost, increasingly lost because of automation. Absolutely. And that's a question that needs to be uh, asked here in the United States. Absolutely. Okay. Afshin, I want to stay with you for the last uh, part of our show, okay. which is... Uh, the part where we talk about the next big story. That's right. What's your next big story? Uh, the CEO being forced to be political. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, what we're seeing now is that uh, there are, we, the Uber CEO right. had to step down uh, from an economic advisory board um, because he got a lot of protest. Now, the protest was, was complicated. Uh, the Uber consumer, the Uber rider tends not to be the profile of the Trump voter. Uh, so there was something of a, of a protest and people were choosing other ride sharing apps. I think CEOs are going to be faced with this uh, consumer revolts, uh, and then they're going to have to either be political whether they want to or not. Yeah, Haroon, what's the next big story? <laughs> oh, there is only one story. Donald Trump, Donald Trump, and Donald Trump. <laughs> Chang Chang, I'm going to ask you, what's your next big story? What's on the radar? Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, the uh, Chinese neighbor, Japanese uh, Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe's visit to uh, Washington, D.C. on February 10th. Uh, we'll, he will be the very first yeah. uh, Asian leader uh, to meet the uh, U.S. President Donald Trump. And it's very complicated because, on the one hand, the, 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 the Japan wants to maintain that kind of alliance with the United States. On the other hand, uh, we see Donald Trump at the very beginning of his presidency, he announced the withdrawal of TPP, so uh, we will see how they interact. You see, Donald Trump dominates everything. <laughs> That's a big story. <laughs> Nathan, I'm not going to ask you what the next big story is. You've just come back from China. You spent two months working there uh -huh. for CGTN. What was your biggest takeaway? Uh, well, it is the next big story, too. <laughs> uh, that's make China great again. Uh, you know, everyone knows about uh, the infrastructure projects in China. What really hit me was the pace, especially for things like high-speed rail. Uh, quite incredible, ambitious targets that are really revolutionizing people's lives. But the other word is innovation. Um, I was very surprised at the pace of innovation, especially when it comes to the Internet, smartphones, really coming up with different solutions for a different market. Everything from WeChat, for example, to city bikes. I was in Shanghai, your hometown, where they've just rolled out a new city bike. You don't need to put it on a rack. It's got a GPS locator. They know where these bikes are. Yeah. You pay one one per hour. It's just revolutionizing how people travel. There are so many different little ideas that are blooming in China, and many outsiders think China is a lot more monolithic than it is. It is quite an incredible, changing society, and it depends where you go and what you see. But uh, uh, maybe the next big story that we haven't really talked about a lot. Right, that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for joining us. 